of the emediapress.com and the Energy Science and Technology Conference. And uh, we'll just do a cu- couple announcements here, and then we'll bring uh, Ernst on, who is the author of the book that um, we'll be discussing on the call, as well as any, any other work that may not be in that book. Um, July 11 to 14 is going to be our upcoming uh, Energy Science and Technology Conference in Hayden, Idaho, which is about an hour from uh, Spokane, Washington. And um, uh, for the conference, it's energysciencenconference.com. We only have about maybe, I don't know, 58 seats left or something like that out of 150. So we're getting close to uh, only about one-third of the seats are available, and they, they will sell out. And uh, we're going to have about 17 presenters, about 22 different presentations. Um, unfortunately, Ernst in uh, Thailand will not be able to join us at the conference, either as a guest or a presenter, but he's certainly welcome to possibly uh, next year. And uh, so, you know, besides the conference at Energy Science Technology uh, or energysciencenconference.com, um, you know, all our books and videos are at emediapress.com. There are digital downloads there. And also there's a couple forums, uh, discussion forums. Uh, one is energysciencenconference.com. Um, that one doesn't have as much as energeticforum.com, but there's quite a bit uh, – uh, there's fewer presenters in there. A lot of that is focused on, you know, some of the Bedini stuff and some of the plasma ignition. Uh, that's where I have the official discussion forum for the plasma ignition support to help people uh, replicate that. And um, there's energeticforum.com, which is quite a bit more more busy. There's more people in there. And in energeticforum.com, that's where um, Ernst has been uh, sharing some of, of his work uh, a little bit off and on over the last, uh, you know, so many years. And more recently, um, I don't know, this is maybe in the last couple months, he had started a, a discussion thread referring to um, Stan Meyer and uh, talking about a specific kind of waveform, which is kind of like this stair-step kind of waveform that kind of incrementally goes up and then it drops really rapidly and then that kind of repeats. And that kind of caught my interest a little bit. And that's a waveform that is shown in uh, some of Stan Meyer's uh, patents and a technical manual. Um, John Bedini was using that type of stair-step waveform on some type of capacitor uh, charging and then uh, uh, discharge kind of method. And that waveform, I think, is common in a couple other uh, different circuits and technologies that, that some people have shared over the years. And Ernst, you were mentioning that um, uh, there's something to that waveform where you think uh, according to your experiments, that somehow it's able to, you know, tap, tap the so-called cosmic energy or cosmic rays or whatever and create an extra source of current in the circuit or something like that. And that's kind of where we picked up the conversation and where you mentioned your book the first time. Um, you, you want to kind of go into a little bit of that and what, what you're kind of mentioning in that discussion? Because Tesla sees uh, electric, electrical effects as being caused by a gas, a gaseous medium. And so if the electricity is a gas, then all laws that rule gases should apply. So if you compress electricity to create a high voltage, then it should radiate its internal heat. And when you expand the electricity, then it should cool down. And if you, you can expand uh, electricity in a discharge, in an electrical discharge, and if the voltage is high enough, you have had sufficient compression and decompression, and it will cool down so much that it, uh, that it will absorb a lot of energy from the surroundings. And this energy is supplied by the primary cosmic rays. And it's, this manifests itself in the fact that more charge will arrive at the receiving electrode than left the, uh, the other electrode. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So, uh, yes. Uh, now, on page 32 in your book, um, which uh, Ernst's book is Tesla's Magnifying Transmitter, Recreating Tesla's Dream, um, if you received an email or a post on Facebook or somewhere about this call, there's a link in there that goes to emediapress.com, a uh, blog post I put in there about Ernst's book, and there's a link in there that will take you straight to Amazon. Um, it's going to get a copy of that. And... Um, So on page 32, it says, The Earth now is not just filled with a fluid medium, the ether, but also with electricity, a gaseous medium. 
And so this is making a distinction that this gaseous medium or this pre pre or sub hydrogen sized gas, I guess you could say, is not necessarily um, uh, synonymous with being the ether in and of itself. So there's the ether, but also the gaseous medium, which is not necessarily the ether. And this is what you're um, showing with some of Tesla's quotes. Would that be correct? Um, if you if you read Tesla carefully, you will see that he mentions sometimes he mentions the ether, and sometimes he mentions the medium. And uh, you are led to believe, of course, that when he says the medium, then he refers to the ether. But that is not the case. He, when he refers to the medium, then he refers to a gaseous medium that causes electrical electrical effects. And when he refers to the ether. Uh, then he refers to a fluid medium that is the, on the basis of uh, matter. Inside this uh, fluid medium, there is submerged in that medium, there is this, this, this gaseous medium. He, I think it's, he says in one of the calls, he says it uh, rather clear, clearly. And so this gaseous medium on, on Mendeleev's original periodic table of elements he had two elements that were smaller and lighter than hydrogen, and would that be the gaseous medium is made of those sub-hydrogen particles or whatever you want to refer to them as? Would you say that's the gaseous medium? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not quite familiar with, the, with the, those two uh, particles, smaller than hydrogen, but it is, it is definitely smaller than hydrogen, and it's even smaller than our... Than, than what we conceive to be uh, an electron. An electron, uh, actually, yeah, Tesla, says about, Tesla talks about electrons, and then he, what he means before 1930, he means the, the particles of this gaseous medium. But after 1930, he says electrons do not exist, and then he's referring to electrons as we see it. So there, there's a difference too. That, that's one problem with Tesla is he kept changing the story as he went along. It makes it hard when he, he doesn't be consistent. Uh, it's not really that he's not consistent, but he has to move with, uh, with, his, uh, with his time. When, when he, he first talked about electrons, other people were not talking about it. And he was talking about this, these, these tiny particles that also make up the primary cosmic rays. And these... Uh, these are particles, he says, that are not, uh, cannot be divisible, are not further divisible, uh, the smallest possible particles. So then later people started talking about electrons as some strange thing that, uh, that's made up an atom and that is in beta rays and that's in cathode rays. But he says that is, that is a myth, that does not exist. So the um, distinctions between the ether and the gaseous medium as being two distinctly different things, um, which Tesla reference, or, you know, if there's more than one, does Tesla give more, um, you know, definition to actually defi define them as being, being two different things? Are you deducing that yes, by the context uh, he's talking, or does he really spell it out? No, I, in, in my book, I, I quote most of the quotes where he is talking about the medium and talking about the ether. And you can see that uh, even in his later years, he talks about a fluid ether, an incompressible fluid ether that fills up all space. And in such a medium, you cannot possibly have uh, long, longitudinal waves, for example. And he, says, he also says, uh, this this ether that we that we recognize that cannot possibly uh, cause the electric flux that I see in my experiments. So there has to be submerged in this ether a, a, another medium of a gaseous nature consisting of particles. Uh, yeah, that that is what he writes. Okay. 
Now in this book, so so how how, how long have you been researching um, Tesla? I think I posted it in your bio on that uh, post I did to let people know about the book. But do you want to give a little bit of background yeah. of your interest and how you got into this and and um, you know what your goals are and what direction you want to you want to move into? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, in in 2005, I, I moved to Thailand because I had to raise my children. My wife died, and I had to raise my children. And I thought, well, in Thailand, I have better chance at that. So uh, I I quit my job and I moved to Thailand. I did not have a job, and I so I had lots of spare time. And I thought I'd be making some money at the stock market because I had done it before, and I wanted to merge my two hobbies, artificial intelligence and stock market, and see if, if that would lead to some results. Uh, that did not give me better uh, investment results, but it, it showed me that the stock markets are heavily manipulated. So I started researching that, and I found the Federal Reserve. So I started researching the Federal Reserve, and I found J.P. Morgan, and I started researching J.P. Morgan, and I found uh, Nikola Tesla and his Warren Cliff project. So that that was, I thought, something that uh, that needed uh, some research. So some, someone needed to dig into this. What what was going on there? What was this man mad, or, or or was he a genius? And what was he trying to do there? And I thought, since I had a lot of time, I have a solid background in physics. Uh, I had sufficient spoons. Uh, to research it. And I live in a place where no one cares what I'd be doing. So I thought I had a better chance at this than most people. So, yeah, I wanted to research this and I started collecting all of uh, Tesla's work, everything I could find, and reading it and tried to copy his experiments and try to see what he must have seen so I could understand his conclusions better. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. And the goal of my project was to find out what Tesla was doing in water uh, if he indeed did have uh, an alternative source of clean energy. And if so, then I want to see that uh, implemented somewhere. So, so that is the project goal. Does that answer so this, Yeah. So this building that we see on the cover of the book, and you know, I, I think you've posted pictures of that online before. Is that completely self-funded, or do you have, you know, have you been receiving donations from people to support your work, or, or what, what, what are you doing to keep this uh, project going? Yeah, well, first I I, I paid everything with my own money, but uh, the experiment started getting bigger and more expensive, and then a colleague of mine visited me. And he saw what I was doing, and he thought it was it was very interesting. And he wanted to set up a company, Ethergy, uh, Ether uh, mm-hmm. to attract funds from other investors who also might be interested in uh, in the same thing that I'm interested in. And so he so he did this, and we found uh, 11 people who wanted to invest some money in it. We got over a little bit over 100,000. Euro, and we decided that we could use that to pay for my equipment, for all test equipment, for the tower, the, the small tower that I built, or had built, and for yeah, all the equipment that I need. So uh, that does not include my salary because uh, there was not enough room for that. But uh, yeah, all equipment is paid for. Mm-hmm. So there's some um, interesting things in your work, and I think you know when I originally sent Eric um, Dollar to copy of the book, he mentioned that you were discussing um, experiencing how when uh, when the transmitter is running, that little by little by little over time it gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and when it turns off. What little by little it kind of goes down, almost like a flywheel speeding up, and then it slowly kind of goes down. Is is that what your experience is? Is that kind of explaining it in simple yes. enough terms? Yes. Yeah. There there's something 
changing. I thought it was something changing in the environment around the coil when you switch it on, but I'm not, not quite sure what it is. But as Tesla also describes this effect, I thought it, I would mention it because perhaps it's related. What I, what I did is I had a large coil sitting on the floor and a smaller coil uh, that, that is uh, tuned to the same frequency. And I moved the top load of the smaller coil, smaller coil inside the field of the bigger coil. And then I tried to measure the spark length on the other side of the, the smaller coil to the ground. So this gives an indicates, indication how much uh, electricity it, it picks up in the various locations within a field. So there are, there are a lot of uh, parameters that, that would uh, influence this uh, measurement, I'm sure. But uh, I noticed that, uh, that the sparks slowly get longer so, uh, if you run the coil for some time. And then if you stop and start again, then you start with a much smaller spark again. So there is some effect in inside the core or maybe in the earth. I don't know where, where it comes from. But it's mm-hmm. definitely something that's repeatable and, uh, yeah, that builds up over time. It, it takes about 30 minutes to build up to its mm-hmm. full length. And then uh, in about 30 minutes, uh, of of uh, off time, then it uh, goes back to uh, the smallest uh, distance. Is, do you think it's completely different from just the air being coming more ionized over time and being more conductive to conduct that arc a little bit longer? Uh, yeah, that's that's a possible a possibility too, but. Um, yeah, I, I cannot see, uh, I cannot make a model in my mind for how that should work. Because I think it's the, uh, it's the, the air. resistance is changing. That could be too. That could be a factor too. I don't know what's yeah, happening. You're running, it's, you're but, running uh, some really, you're running some really strong current in the ground, and you yeah. normally have to distribute that over about 10 acres, like Tesla did at Wardenclyffe. He had a massive underground structure to distribute that current so what's yeah. probably happening is the ground is polarizing and it's trying to form its channels to carry that intense current which is you know probably ripping the molecules apart and then then that dissipates after a while that's what i would suspect would be the cause of it yeah that's a, that's a possibility sure but uh i only mentioned it because uh it's the same effect that Tesla mentions, and I thought, yeah, it's interesting. What, whatever causes this effect in my coils may also have caused the effect in, in his coils. Well, you know, maybe um, back around 2003, 2002, 2003, uh, John Bedini at one of his shops, he had a uh, earth radio system where he had a transmitter, and it went into a ground rod in the earth, and then he had a receiver that you could take the ground rod and touch it to the, you know, touch it to a tree or to a rock or a tire on a car, almost anywhere around there, and you could pick up the, uh, the radio. Um, and he had that installed for about maybe three months. I wasn't there, but Peter Lindemann was there quite a bit, um, watching all those experiments at that time. And... To start with, uh, the receiver could only re- pick it up from uh, a you know, relatively short distance, but little by little by little, over the course of about three months, um, you could pick it up a couple miles down the road. You could go to a river, stick the rod in there two miles down the road, you know, uh, two miles away, and you could still pick up the signal. And it's almost like there's something, you know, growing through the ground. I, I think it might have been... Uh, Jerry Vassilados, you know, some of his work is good. Some of it seems to kind of be mixing truth and fiction. It's kind of hard to find out really what's going on, but he does have some good references. And he kind of mentions this dendrite type of effect, you know, growing through the ground, maybe kind of like what Eric is talking about, maybe the oh, yeah, minerals are all, all rising. Those, uh, those wood-burning things that I did and the shapes of the discharges – was yeah. the same kind of thing. After every discharge, these feelers 
golden ratio dendrite type feelers would grow out and then that cycle it would advance and then it would go dormant until the next cycle and then it would spread a little more so I, I think that's what's going on is that the earth the soil and the minerals in the earth are becoming polarized by the um, the waveforms and then forming these little channels because you can uh, the, the brute force example of that is when lightning strikes the earth out in the desert where it's all like granite like sand is you can dig one of these things out of the ground. Sometimes they're several feet long. Yeah, the solidified, I can't remember what they're called, but... They're called the fulgurites. Yes, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, Ernst, do you think there's, some, there's something like that that's happening? I mean, you're saying it's possible. Did Tesla give any indication in his opinion what that effect, that flywheel kind of effect is, where it kind of builds up that momentum and it gets going and get stronger then little by little by little kind of dies out i think he he mentions two effects that, that can lead to this uh, result one is uh, the uh, ionization of the air as you also mentioned and the other effect is that uh, you create a pools in the in the earth that uh, that just just keeps on uh, oscillating for a while because the resistance of the earth is uh, very small once once you're in, so uh, that can go on for quite a lot, uh, quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the other um, interesting things is you have um, done some experiments where you're like pinging into the earth and getting a signal back. Do you want to kind of explain ex, uh, ex, explain some of that? Uh, yeah, well, it, it's more of a side side uh, project from my project because uh, yeah, we are studying the magnifying transmitter, but we're mostly studying the the magnifying part and not so much the, the transmitting part. But as we had all the system uh, running, so we thought we might as well look at uh, this. Uh, this 11.7 hertz uh, thing. So uh, I thought it cannot be a frequency of the coils because you need a very, very large coil to have a resonance frequency of uh, 11.7 uh, hertz. Or you need an enormous capacitance to, to get that. So it cannot be that. So the only uh, possibility then is the spark gap frequency. And that makes sense in a way too, because uh, when you think of electricity as Tesla does, then uh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, what I tried to do is I changed. I had a spark gap, a rotary spark gap, controlled by a stepper motor, and the stepper motor was controlled by a, a, a crystal oscillator, so that I could. Uh, that I could set to yeah, to six digits uh, uh, position. So I changed the the frequency of the spark gap, and I found that at some frequencies the coil worked better than at other frequencies. Uh, and then I want want to know why that is. So let me see. I did a number of experiments. Uh, to see what what could be the cause of that, I have to think how. Uh, oh yes, yes. So I, I started measuring uh, a number of things: the, the 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 voltage on the power supply and the spark gap, and I compared those two. And I found that uh, if you have a, you know, a very powerful uh, break in the spark gap when the voltage is at its maximum, then about 85 milliseconds later, you have uh, a zero voltage on, on the power supply because we have 50, we have 50 hertz here. So 85 milliseconds, that is four times a full wave and a quarter that takes it to a zero voltage. So there's no uh, voltage on the power supply. Uh, just before that, uh, we have uh, a break from the spark up again. But at, at that exact time, we get another break. 
of spark up. And that energy cannot come from the capacitors because they were drained in the in the break before that. It cannot come from the power supply because the voltage is zero. So the only place that it can come from is from an echo that comes from the uh, from the earth. Does this so looking at that? How, how would you describe the inside of the Earth? Do you think it gives um, any credit to the idea that uh, the inside of the Earth might be hollow? I'm not sure. I don't know what uh, what the inside of the Earth would look like. And and but I think what modern science says that it looks like with a metal core and uh, all this nonsense. That is certainly not the case. But whether we hollow, I, I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. What what I do believe is that there's a lot of this uh, gaseous medium, a lot of electricity inside the Earth, and you can set that uh, in motion by by uh, a spark that triggering, triggering at the right frequency. And when that's set in motion, you can modulate on that Big wave, uh, a tone, uh, uh, a high high pitch frequency, and this high pitch frequency you can pick up with your coils, and uh, and thus you can send energy uh, all, all over the world. Mm-hmm. And in the forum, you posted a diagram relating to that, which is that famous diagram where there's the picture of the Earth and a pump you know, compressing air or sound or whatever it is on top of it. Um, would you say that's kind of, that's more uh, an analogy of – you want to explain yeah. how that's related to, yeah. to this exact um, experiment? Yeah, that, that is what uh, what uh, the image of Tesla gave us, the, uh, the earth with the, with the pump. So uh, – when you when you read the uh, what is it called the uh, pre-hearing interview from 19 what is it 1917 I think uh, then Tesla talks about it relatively clear more clear than uh, than in other places so you you have two things that you put in the earth first it's this uh, larger wave that is the energy that you put in the the electricity moving uh, at the frequency of 11.7 hertz, going back and forth, and on top of that, uh, that is that's your energy that, that you put in the air, and on top of that frequency you put the uh, higher frequency, and that is to open the valve, as it were, to take the energy out at the location where you want to take it out. So, yeah. Is that, is that clear, or do, do you want me to? Okay, yeah, I kind of get the gist of it. Um, yeah, I was just looking for the reference inside the uh, uh, the book here. Um, you know, recently Tesla, you had Tesla said, in one of his patents or articles gives some kind of uh, transit time uh, that had to be maintained. In other words, the the oscillatory transients had to occur no farther apart than something like a twelfth of a second, which would be the response of the inside of the Earth, but I can't remember what patent that was in. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying, yeah. Okay, so so Tesla describes the same experiment or the same experience of getting these pings back out of the Earth? Well, he just mentioned yes, that that yes. was a necessity. He wasn't clear about it because it was a patent. I think it's that one, you know, with the, the toroidal capacitance and the long slender extra coil. And I think it's 1900 or 1901. I think, I think it was in that one. But, but it was something like a twelfth of a second was a necessity that you would have to kick the uh, waveform at those, at those intervals in order to keep it maintained, which has nothing to do with the frequencies that he was transmitting. So that means it would have to be the Earth itself that was initiating yes. that time delay. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, yes. So you have these two frequencies. One is the 11, uh, or the, what is it, 11.79 or so. It, it depends a little bit on where you are on the globe because it, it's 
to relate to the the diameter of the Earth at your location. So as the Earth is not a perfect sphere, sphere, it will differ a little bit the location. But it's always around 11.7 Hertz. And that means that it's uh, 85, about 85 milliseconds that you have to have between your pulses. Yeah, so that's in uh, so on page 31 in the book, um, which is Tesla's magnifying transmitter, recreating Tesla's dream, uh, by Ernst Willem Vanderberg. And on page 31 at the bottom is the uh, the old diagrams uh, showing the hand pump on the surface of the Earth. And then on page 32, um, 33, that has the uh, references to the um, to 11.7 or so uh, hertz, and uh, the 84.9, uh, 85 milliseconds, uh, if anybody wants to um, go straight to that section in the book um, later on. Um, now, recently, um, you had sent Eric a package of, I guess, some pictures and diagrams and some other stuff. Is that something that, that you're open to sharing what was in that package, or is that not ready for discussion yeah, yet? No, no. No, most of that is shared already on the internet. It's uh, the the larger part of it is uh, a document that I wrote while I was uh, setting up the whole system. So I was experimenting with uh, different uh, uh, coils, uh, different uh, primary circuits, and all that. And the the goal was to reach at least a million volt with uh, with my setup. So. The, the that document describes the journey to this uh, one million fold. Okay. And uh, now, Eric, okay, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. There were a That's few other documents that were related to uh, things that uh, that Eric asked me, but I, I'm not sure anymore what uh, what was in that document. But and everything okay. is free. Everything can be copied all over the internet. I don't care. Okay. So, yeah, maybe uh, I can get copies of those from Eric, or if, if maybe you're able to email them to me or something, I can, you know, uh, post them in the same yeah, I can, I can, post with your book or something. I can try to find them. Yeah, I can try to find what I sent to it. But I'm not sure oh. what, what everything is uh, in the second. Okay. Um, Eric, did you have a question or, or you had a comment or something about some of that material you received? Did you, you want to ask uh, Ernst on the call or? Tell them what your thoughts were to, um, on something. It, there, there's a, it's really detailed, so what I'm going to do is I'm, when i got the time to sit down with it for a day, I'm going to you know, point out some of the things that can make it operate a lot better. One, one of the main kind of flaws in the whole setup is the generator is set up for constant potential and not constant current. It needs another type of regulator that that would have to be made. I used to use these methodologies on the ships for when we had a big diesel generator set running a big AC motor that the, um, that the generator ran constant current and not constant potential so that the motor wouldn't draw excessive current on the start. So in the situation with this disruptive discharge, if you feed it with a constant potential, it tends to short the the power supply out, and then you have to have these enormous ballast resistors or reactances, and, and they end up burning up all the energy, you know, which you've got to pay for in the fuel tank. But if you build a regulator for the generator set that's constant current, that way when there's a short circuit, a complete short circuit, the generator does not put out any energy. And when you have an open circuit, then the generator will put out all the possible energy that's potentially available to it to to start the current flowing and then that regulates the arc. So in the old arc street lighting systems from from back in the early Edison days, all they were all hooked in series and they were run on a constant current power supply. So I, I would recommend that as a change and then as far as your your service power goes, you would just have a solar inverter or something to run your your auxiliaries, like your stepper motors and your lights and your oscilloscopes and what have you, it would it would operate much more efficiently and and probably uh, much better waveforms and spark gap commutation and all that kind of stuff. 
So I don't, I don't know if you know how to design those kind of things. If not, I could design a constant current regulator for you if you're willing to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll look what is available. I, I didn't think about it uh, yet. Uh, I, I have to, um, yeah, I have to think about it. Uh, if I can, maybe there are things available already because I, uh, in the generator there is this uh, controller that controls the voltage. I guess that it should be possible to put another controller in that makes the current. Uh, constant instead of the voltage. That should be possible. Yeah. That would help a lot. That would help me a lot, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else, Eric? Or no, the rest kind of, of the main it thing? I'll, I'll, do, I'll do in writing because it's got a circuit details and, and what have you. So it's, it'll take some time and diagrams. That's really be the best way to do it rather than on the phone. Sure. I did want to remark on the um, generator thing because I saw in one of the diagrams that there was a 100,000-watt ballast resistor to render the current constant, and a 100,000-watt resistor is kind of an expensive proposition to operate when you've got to pay for the diesel. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. You know, there's definitely uh, quite a few different topics in here and quotes from Tesla and before I open it for questions and ho hopefully there's I think Dan had had a couple questions or maybe it was already answered so far but uh, before I do open up for questions one thing that's always been kind of fascinating to me is the idea of this um, which Tesla was talking about in the uh, increasing about increasing human energy where he goes into this concept of um, something about burning nitrogen um, one of the first references I, I saw from that, I think, was in William Lyon's book, Occult Ether Physics, which um kind of an interesting book, I guess. He kind of has his own twist on things, but there, there seems to be some valid concepts in there. And in the end of that book, he kind of describes the um, this nitrogen process inside of an iron, you know, square kind of cylinder and some electrodes in there sparking from a uh, high-voltage transformer and doing something about, uh, you know, making a reference to burning nitrogen. And he offered it as a free paper, I guess. It was called the Free Energy Surprise, which was kind of his interpretation of that whole experiment. And that's been coming up lately again. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that, Ernst, on, yeah. on that whole process and burning nitrogen and what that's about? Yeah, sure, but I, I'm afraid I see that a little bit different than, than the way you describe it. Um, I, I think these are analogies. It, it doesn't mean that uh, they are impossible in the literal sense of, the, of the, how he says it, but I think he, he wants to describe another uh, effect. He says uh, the, there's a lot of uh, nitrogen in the air in the, that we should make available for, uh, that we should put in the ground, we should make fertilizer or put in the ground so plants can grow. I think that's an analogy for for the what he wanted to do with the watering cliff. He wants to get the energy out of the atmosphere, put it in the ground, so that plants, that is uh, industrial plants, can grow all over the world. He uses a, a few other uh, analogies as well. Uh, for example, the self-acting engine and uh, the, the economic way of producing iron. Those are also uh, also analogies to describe how the how the magnifying transmitter works. Uh, you want me to go into the, the the iron one, for example? Sure. So, wh what he says is uh, you can. He has a more efficient way to uh, to get iron from the ores, but iron here stands for um, electricity. And he says uh, near the Great Lakes, there's a certain uh, sand ore here in available in large quantities. And near the Great Lakes, he had just installed this. Uh, 
hydro hydroelectric power plants in uh, Mayaka Falls. So the the iron ore is a source for iron, but the hydroelectric power plant is a source for electricity. So there's the, the analogy, and uh, he says he he wants to use electricity to melt to smelt the uh, ores, but not use it directly. You first use the electricity in uh, electro- uh, electrolysis to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Then you okay. recombine the hydrogen with uh, oxygen from the air, not from the one you separated it from. Um, that heat you use to smelt the ores. Um, then you create a regenerative loop, thereby reusing the heat from the iron that comes out of the furnace to preheat the ores that go into the furnace. Hmm. So that, that process that he describes is exactly uh, analog, uh, an exact analogy to what he uh, wants to do with the uh, warring cave. You want to say something? Okay. Or should I continue? Yeah, no, go, go ahead and continue. Okay. So what he wants to do in Wardenclyffe is uh, he used, first used some electricity to, to, uh, to raise the, the, the potential, and then cool it down so he takes out some of the energy. That, then you absorb extra energy from the uh, atmosphere. So that is the uh, hydrogen-oxygen uh, analogy. Uh, then the extra energy is collected and put into the earth, and that what is not used, uh, what is not taken out at other places of the earth, is received again in the secondary coil, and is uh, a bias, bias your uh, energy in the secondary coil. So it's reused. So there you have your uh, regenerative loop in the system. So that yeah, I think it's too right. Uh, yeah, that, that that's a that's an analogy. I think. Yeah, I think that's something that you um, uh, posted exactly on that a couple years back, which was kind of like a comparison between that magnifying transmitter and the like an atmospheric self um, acting engine kind of concept. And I think that I I had. Uh, Put a post on uh, emediapress.com to refer back to your posts okay. on that um, on, on that exact topic. Okay. Yeah. That was uh, uh, a post where I described the, the what I call the Tesla code, and the Tesla code is not not so much a code, but it's the way Tesla speaks in analogies, and that is what I try to uh, show in that uh, document that I posted uh, mm-hmm. that you posted there. Okay. Is there anything um, that you want to share uh, before opening up for questions? Anything else or announcements or, or any requests? Or? Uh, I don't think so, no. I, I, I hope that, uh, that yeah, this, this work will open up, uh, yeah, will, will attract new people to, to this uh, to this way of thinking and looking at Tesla's work, and perhaps also experimenting. So uh, I hope people will start experimenting with this and think about uh, these concepts, so we can break free from uh, from what modern science tells us and what is obviously wrong. And can uh, I hope that someday we can. Uh, recreate this this way of generating energy that that uh, uh, describes. I think it can be done at a smaller scale. You don't need to go to to uh, this warning tip scale. Uh, so yeah, uh, in that in that way, I I serve two masters. One is the the, the world as a whole that I want uh, this this energy to be used. And the other people are the people that uh, that take me their money to 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 uh, experiment with this. 
and they want to they would like to see a big plant being set up and uh yeah Okay. Uh, Are you? Um, uh, we were, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. That's it. Uh, okay. okay. Hey. Um, are you uh, accepting donations or um, requesting donations from people? Do you have a website or a PayPal account that you can direct people to if they want to donate anything to donate anything to support your work? Or. Um. Yeah, I I have a PayPal me, but I think it's PayPal me dot uh, uh, slash mage and then five zeros M A G E and then five zeros. But uh, the exact link I will have to look up in my computer. I cannot see it now because I'm in my car now. Um, okay. Also, yeah, if you get I, that uh, to me, I have a lot. Yeah, yeah, I have some cryptocurrency uh, uh, ways of. Uh, uh, Supporting. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. So uh, since we don't have a lot of people on the call right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everybody. And if anybody has a question, um, go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself, where you're from, and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I don't know if you're gonna shoot shoot first, Dan. Um, sure. Thank you. Hi, Ernst. My name's Dan. Um, I had just recently learned about you and your work um, from a Facebook post, um, and so I joined the call. So um, I was curious. Uh, I was I see the book here on Amazon and just kind of read a little bit about the intro. Um, it looks like there's a picture on the cover. Is the bottom picture is that a picture of your your lab or your your current Tesla coil that you're experimenting with? And I guess. Does the book cover kind of the technical details of your construction of your coil? Like what frequency does it run at? Is it running at the Earth's natural resonant frequencies, or does it go into that level of technical detail? Uh, that's a lot of questions. Uh, well, first, the, uh, the the picture on the the bottom picture on the front gets to the outside of the of the lab. Now there's a generator room in front of it, so the, there's something at the time. So that is the left that I have, yes. Uh, on the back of the uh, the book, you see the inside of that lab, and there you see the, the coils that I'm using right now. Um, let me see. Uh, you cannot see this part yet, and you cannot see so much else because it was being set up and cleaned at that time. But you, you see the coils. Uh, what, you, what the book describes, the book is, uh, goes from Tesla. Uh, work, start out from Tesla's work, and that is the focus uh, of the book, really. I want to show that it's not me fantasizing about what could be uh, the, the purpose of all this. I want to show that it's Tesla's words describing uh, this whole system. Uh, so my, my, my own experiments take up only a very small part of the book and are not described in uh, great detail. If you want to learn about that, then uh, well, Alan will put a link uh, somewhere to, to a document describing all that. You can download that for free. Okay. It's, it's been on the internet uh, for a long time already. Cool. That's 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 wonderful. Thank you. So it's as I understand it, then it's mainly just uh, researching what Tesla said, what he did, and putting it in a modern context. context. Um, and just kind of verifying that? Yes, yeah, that, that is what my product is about. Uh, but okay. it, the book is, yeah, I, I copied most of uh, the relevant Tesla quotes in the book because I know that people, if I only uh, give a reference to yeah, Tesla Tesla, people are not going to look it up. I want people to read Tesla's words, so I, I included all the, the quotes of Tesla, the relevant quotes in the book. Um, and yeah, show what what it, what it actually means, and not not so much in modern terms because much of modern terms do not make any sense. Like I said already with the with the electron, the a thing like that simply cannot exist. It, it, it's ridiculous to to think that that is what constitutes electricity. Sure, uh, and I was reading some of uh, the work from Richard Hull, who was talking a lot about how Tesla 
when he was in college, the way they thought about and, and taught electricity was through electro electrostatics and, you know, through experiments like capacitor dissection, where you take the capacitor apart and there's no charge and you assemble it, and then there is a charge, that really the, the capacitor, it's the dielectric. It's, it has nothing to do with the plates. And so the way that Tesla viewed the world, you have the earth as one plate of the capacitor, the air as the dielectric, the ionosphere being the other plate, and those electric fields would extend basically throughout the entire Earth. Um, and that kind of put things in a lot of perspective to me, I think, because I think I had kind of, you know, thought that, well, maybe the wireless transmission wasn't a possibility. But after reading some of his words, I thought, well, you know, maybe – Maybe we were all wrong, and Tesla was right this whole this whole time. So, still a, a truly fascinating yes. subject. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, wireless transmission is a reality. So I've already demonstrated it, and now it's got out into the ham radio people. There was. One guy that was supposed to get on the phone today that's been doing this, he's a ham radio operator, and um, and these hams are having no problem communicating at least a 1,000 miles through the earth using uh, basically a simple extra coil series fed by their uh, their radio transceiver. It's, it's, it's definitely a reality. There's no question about it that, that it does work. Another thing I wanted to point out is the electric field does not stop at the ionosphere. It's initiated by this giant anode in the middle of the solar system called the sun, which Tesla claims that he measured the voltage of the sun. Unfortunately, he didn't reveal how he did it. And it was in the order of, uh, I forget, it was either 20 billion volts. I think it was 200 billion volts. 216 billion volts, Okay, so you know what that number is. And that this electrostatic field was a necessity uh, for his system to operate because he stated that if the Earth was empty, so to speak, of electricity, if there wasn't this electric force penetrating it radially, that his system would not work. So that immediately brings to mind that he's communicating through the lines of force, which are the polarizations of the particles of the the electric medium or or the electric fluid, as it was known from Ben Franklin and his contemporaries all the way up to J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson stuck with the electric fluid theory throughout his entire life, well into the 30s, and now it's quite evident that Tesla also adhered to the same theory. Yeah. I wanted to, to add to this uh, that, uh in in modern the modern view of electricity is that it is something that runs through the wires. But if you look at it, uh, what you what you can measure about electricity is the electric field around it and magnetic field around current, and that's all taking place outside of the conductor, not inside the conductor. The, it's even so that. People believe there cannot be an electric field inside the conductor, which is also not true. But most of the electric field of, in a conductor is outside of the conductor. So most of the electricity should also be outside of the uh, conductor. Still there, Dan? Uh, quiet. Uh, huh? Yes, I'm here. I'm just I'm taking it all in. This is all new to me. So well, it sounds, I one think one thing, one thing I want like to point new... out with the the electric field inside the conductor and outside the conductor. In electromagnetism, which is the type of electricity we use presently, uh, Heaviside being kind of the father of electromagnetic theory, uh, the conductor is called an ob obstructor, and it, does, it resists the entry of the electromagnetism. But there's another type of conduction that's not clear, and uh, Tesla mentions this, and J.J. Thompson's theories uh, lead in this direction, and I've, I've hit on this in my own presentations. There's a type of conduction where the intermolecular spaces are little capacitors, and if you can find that mode, and Tesla 
was hunting for this mode all throughout his experiments was to get a way to get the electricity to flow in the wire without an external field. It's my belief that that's what he was trying to do inside the Earth. It was not an electromagnetic situation, but a longitudinal electrostatic situation where the, the atoms and the space between them became a series of capacitors, and that's the way he looked at conduction and gases. And J.J. Uh, and J. Thompson was not in argument with him about that, and I actually managed to, to demonstrate it mathematically in, in one of my notebook uh, series that's not edited or printed. I think it's notebook number four, I believe, where I, I point out that there's this other element of, of conduction that that's what Tesla was striving for, was this unclosed current longitudinal conduction. And he pointed out yes, that actually yes, but, but, a plasma in a tube, uh, a gas, gas discharge was one of these type conductions, and he believed there would not be a magnetic field associated with that. So is that a, a byproduct of the frequency, or how would you have managed that? Uh, mode changing. In fact, actually, there's a um, – when John Bedini first made his entrance – into the public light. He had claimed, I still don't necessarily believe it, but I think people have witnessed it. Uh, I don't think Bedini really knew how he had come about it, but he had managed to configure a recipe of semiconductor that did the necessary mode converting where he was able to get substantial quantities of electricity to flow through very tiny wires without any effects of impedance or heating at all. Uh, and I think Aaron may have witnessed this. Uh, I'm not clear on the details, but I tend to believe that he did do that. And this is something that, that I've been looking towards also, but uh, I don't really have a laboratory to do those kind of experiments. But, uh, but at any rate, without the laboratory, I use mathematics, and so far mathematically I've demonstrated that, that it is a conceivable reality. Yes. Yeah, I'm not yeah, that was what I wanted to say. Oh, yeah? Yeah, go, go earn it. That, that aligns with what, that, that, what I, that aligns with, uh, with what I said about the, the fields inside the Earth. You have the electric medium, the medium uh, electricity, which is not uh, electric charge. So inside that medium, you can have a, a longitudinal wave. And in that medium, you can then uh, you can polarize that into uh, uh, electromagnetic electromagnetic uh, effect. Uh, so there are, there are two different things. The 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 medium electricity is a gaseous medium that that clings to matter as uh, as Tesla describes it. So it's inside matter and outside matter, but away from matter, it gets less and less dense. But inside matter, it's always present, uh, inside and around matter. And that is what causes, causes the electrical effect. So, um, yeah, electric charges are produced, as it were, by this uh, medium. And they are two different things. Yeah, uh, you cannot have uh, longitudinal electromagnetic waves. That doesn't make sense. But you can have longitudinal waves in the... In the medium. So, can you go back to because I, I asked if it was um, a matter of the frequency, and you said it was changing the mode. So, I, I don't understand what you mean by changing the mode. Well, it's like you can change from three phase to six phase with the transformer connection, or with the Tesla transformer, you can change from the regular bipolar two-phase to monophase or single-phase. That's how the Tesla transmitter works because there's really only one active terminal. That's the one that connects to the Earth itself. And the elevated capacity basically is just a reflector that directs that force back down into the Earth. And then when you're in that longitudinal mode, then you get this particular type of conduction that I referred to abstractly where Ernst 
came up with a more physical description. Inside the, the inner atomic dimensions, the concentration of the electrical fluid or its intensity is extremely high. That's actually how the, the output of a nuclear detonation works. It has nothing to do with E equals MC squared. Is when you, when you bust that atom apart, there is so much electricity concentrated in there that it just produces one extreme frequency impulse of gamma rays and then scatters down from that. So this is what's locked up inside the matter. And if you can get into its mode, you would have to have one of these monopolar converters, which is what the Tesla transformer is, and then you can get into that particular mode of conduction because it's monopolar and this current carries no magnetic field. So there's no electromagnetism and there's no velocity of light. Those things all disappear. So it sounds like uh, the high voltage, it, it produces a lot of potential, but not a lot of current. So therefore, the electromagnetic... Oh, no, no, there's, there's, pl there's, pl there's plenty of both. Uh, I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about currents of thousands of amperes and with a rather substantial electromotive force behind it. So, so it's, it's not you know, a, just a little static type of situation. I mean, in Bedini's case, I think he, he managed to transmit several hundred watts through like 30 gauge wires without any heating or effects whatsoever. So once you change the mode, the resistance disappears. Hmm. Well, so I'll have to like look those, him up. Kind of like those, those toys. You know, there's a ball bearing toy where you've got like five ball bearings hanging on strings, and you, you lift one and let it hit the string, and the other one at the other end immediately jumps out, but you don't see any of the balls in between move. Yeah, a, a Newton's cradle is what that's called. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that experiment by John Bedini was his attempt to to figure out and replicate what T. Henry Morway was uh, was doing, whatever his converter process. And there is an old video from about 1984 of John Bedini kind of giving the first release to the public of his experiments on there. If you go to emediapress.com, you can scroll down to these 1984 John Bedini videos. I think one was on a motor and one was on that uh, crystal process. It was a bat, it was a mixture of different chemicals and stuff that created a type of crystal that translated the electrostatic impulses into, um, you know, something that would re really do usable work. So, did you have any other comments on that, um, Ernst, or um, or do you have any, any any other questions, Dan, or? No, I think I'm good. I think I'd uh, oh. buy the book and, and read it. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else on the – oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Ernst. I, said, I, I hope you enjoy it. Anything that you, that you want to cover, Ernst, or any announcements you want to make? Uh, you know, if we don't really have any more questions, we can, we can probably go ahead and wrap it up. And I'll try to, I'll try to get this up on YouTube um, sometime next week. Um, uh, I don't really uh, have much. Uh, I, I'm glad to see that uh, there's so much uh, that Eric and I agree on because I will, uh, I will think that there are some differences between uh, between our views. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that there's so much that we agree on and, uh, as well. But I, I would like to mention one thing where we disagree and I, I will, will only mention it and ask Eric and uh, yeah, to, have, to have a look into that uh, because uh, I hear I, I downloaded the last uh, live call and I heard you say that um, the top load the, the cupola of the, of the warning test tower could not have been uh, grounded and I think there's, uh, there's evidence that it was Grounded. And if I look in my experiments and look at the ground currents, I measure the ground current in the secondary coil and in what I would call the return circuit, that is the cupola and its uh, inductance to the ground. And I measure uh, four times 
greater current in the in the in the latter one than in the in the one from the secondary coil. So I think uh, the transmission is is uh, mostly affected in the in that by that ground connection rather than the the ground connection of the second secondary coil. And to to understand the whole circuit, I think you have to look at it as a, a big uh, spark gap oscillator where the cupola is the capacitance, its ground connection is the inductance, and you have a spark gap, and you have the, the power supply. So that makes up a spark gap uh, oscillator, and a very powerful one, and one that adds extra current in the, in the ground connection. So uh, I, w- I would like to, to, to hear your thoughts uh about this when when you uh maybe maybe think you you have different views you may maybe you need some time to 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 let it sink in or i don't know or maybe you can comment on it right away or maybe yeah i don't know maybe you want to do it in private on in the uh, conversation i don't know but I, I would like to know your thoughts on it because uh, yeah i i see in my experiment that the second ground connection is a much stronger current, so it will transmit much better than the the first ground connection of the, the secondary coil. That, that's my reason. Did you get that, Eric? Yeah, kind of. So, yeah, I, I don't believe that the thing should be grounded, and actually, when you go through all the calculations, it, it kind of it really screws everything up, and it's in defiance of of what Tesla had claimed all along. But I'm not going to uh, you know, no, no, no. anybody from experimenting. But the, but the only way to really determine is to is to transmit to a distant station, and then see you know how the differences are and what have you. Now I did. I don't know where this came from. I got so many papers and things here and what have you, but when I was in my car out in the desert studying all this stuff the other day, uh, Tesla had referred to this um, this grounding thing because there's a number of diagrams that have been reprinted. And then he spoke in such a way that uh, he had a... Tesla was funny about this stuff, and that's why you really got to be careful about interpreting what Tesla says and what have you. He, after going through the, it's not grounding. What it is, it's a um, there's both the radio frequency chokes. His first uh, appearance of this is in the Colorado Springs note, where if you use radio frequency chokes, you can hold the elevated capacity up, and the chokes will equalize the gradient, and you won't get you know burning of the insulating supports or what have you. But to use straight wires makes absolutely no sense because those are electromagnetic radiators. So the final sentence that Tesla had in that Long Island pages that I had copies of, that my system is different than that. And so at that point, I figured, okay, it it doesn't make any sense electrically. Uh, What he was striving for was something this is very typically used in radar is you have quarter wave um, stanchions that hold the transmission line up and then you don't have to use insulators and he was toying with that idea but I can't see how that would have been implemented in the final design but apparently that's open to question so my contention is is I will not speculate beyond Colorado Springs because Colorado Springs is something that has concrete engineering data which which will be what I present and I have a lot of experience in physically transmitting with this for decades, and I know it's very similar. You know, the car radio used to work with the Tesla coil before this stuff became solid-state digital. And the little yes, antenna... I'm, I'm pretty sure. Of, go ahead. No, I'm pretty sure you have a lot of experiments transmitting, and much more than I have, because I, I have not focused on transmitting at all. Uh, I've just it, it was a side, side way in my, in my project. But uh, I think the, the 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 ground current is uh, a measure of how successful your transmission will be, and so if you increase can increase this ground current, you will reach 
uh, further. And in in my setup, as I said, I have a, a much a four times greater ground current in the in the return circuit as in the uh, in the the ground current the secondary coil. And as you say, with the Colorado Springs node, a Tesla also experiments with uh, this second spark gap, as you can see in the diagrams from, I think, from the top of my head. It's uh, July 30, uh, August 19, and some other days. You see some diagrams where, it's, where, it's also, where you also have this spark gap and, and the secondary coil. And all throughout uh, September, he uh, experiments with uh, various setups. Uh, so uh, it's it's not that you have um, a, the three coil system and then you ground the top load of that. You need the the spark gap between them. And if you if you just ground the top load, that doesn't make any sense, as you say. That that's perfect. yeah, I understand that. But there has to be a spark gap, and then you you ground the the top load, and then you get this much greater current. And uh, I'm not sure if you uh, if you have tried that ever, and if you have not tried it, then I would like you to try it and see if you if that gives you better results as as it gives me better results. Yeah, right now I'm not in a position to do those kind of experiments, but but the um, the comparison that I was making is that the old car radios used to use the Tesla system that actually. Yeah the little whip was not really doing any receiving. It was actually the body of the car that was doing the receiving. But the, um, the problem was if you went into a tunnel, it still didn't work, and that's because the, the high side of the Tesla transformer could not seek the mutual capacity to, to outer space, and therefore it had lost its ability to transmit. And Tesla remarks in one of his articles, and actually... Uh, his uh, assistant, a radio engineer, famous radio engineer, Fritz Lowenstein, refused to agree with it. The Tesla pointed out there was two types of capacities off the elevated terminal. There was the self-capacity that just took it back to ground, to ground and closed the loop. And that, that's what would happen if you ground, grounded the elevated terminal. You would have a lot of current, but it would be an electromagnetic current. But the other type of capacitance was mutual capacitance, and it reached out in the space and then that allowed you to get the monopolar current. So, so that's kind of uh, that's how I've been approaching the thing. And, um, mm -hmm. and and being that I've had such good results, that you know I, I will tend to stick with the method that I have theoretical and practical experience with. And and as as I've said, the communications aspect of this is starting to. Uh, to gain interest, particularly with this EMP uh, concern that everybody has now, because a Tesla system, even though it's very, very narrow bandwidth, it's really not good for much of anything wider than Morse code. That's why we ended up with the Alexanderson system, which is an improvement of it. Uh, it does have that penetrating capability, and it cannot be uh, – Really, there's nothing there that can really be damaged by a nuclear EMP, and you could maintain a global network of uh, emergency communication stations that would at least keep important, you know, communications going on in the human race while everything else was burned to a crisp. Okay. So that, that's why when I was talking to you, I was encouraging you to go to the vacuum tube mode and then – solicit, uh, you know, ham radio operators or experimenters or whatever to see how far away they can pick up your station, you wouldn't really need a lot of power because the receivers are so sensitive. And then uh, the receiver itself, I got the designs, you know, for the receiving coil on this thing called the Crystal Radio Initiative, which is very easy for people to build. And uh, yeah. see how far you could transmit with... Um, with the vacuum tube oscillator, which also, if you pulsed it, it would give you a, a lot more accurate idea of what kind of response you're getting from the inside of the earth, because you don't have all that spark gap noise and side bands and intermodulation. You just have a nice, clean radar pulse, and then you can have a very sensitive medium wave radio that would uh, that would respond to the echo. That's That's how I would 
in fact, actually, after talking to you, I'm going to encourage some people to do that with the um, with the 1800 megacycle coils or 1800 kilocycle coils that presently the people that I know are working with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, as I said, uh, until now we have focused on the magnifying part, on the on the on the generating more energy in this system, and right. we have some final experiments. To, to to do that to prove to prove that it works. After that, we will uh, definitely switch to the transmitting part and, and see how we can uh, how far we can reach how, how if we can transmit a signal all over the world. That will be uh, yeah something something new. So that's what Tesla was basically trying to do is to set up a way. Yeah. to convey energy from point A to point B, first for communications and then for power. And if he would have stayed focused, uh, he would have been successful. But unfortunately, Tesla, something happened to Tesla at Colorado Springs. And after that point, Tesla became very mystical and vague and sometimes contradicting himself and... Colorado Springs is still a mythical enigma other than what we got in the notebook. Uh, that notebook, needless to say, because I've, I've got a presentation in scale models coming up, I've been going through every letter of it, and it seems like that that notebook is incomplete. And once he got that thing finally tuned up with his you know, keen ability, experimenter's ability to bring everything into that ultra-resonant point, not just regular resonance, but an ultra-resonant point, something happened that wigged him out. That's my belief. Something happened that, that shocked Tesla to the point that he could really never be the same again. He experienced something so fantastic and so out of this world that, that it left him kind of uh, disconnected. If, if you see what I mean, that's my theory. Yeah, I, I think. The, yeah, I think. I, he, he certainly did see a number of things that uh, that took him by surprise. Uh, but I see the his, the change of uh, of style in his writings. I can see that starting earlier from 1895, about where his laboratory laboratory burned down. After that, he starts to get more fake and evasive in his answers. While before that, he was very precise and uh, complete in his answers. After that date, he he, he you know, got more fake and and started using these analogies in his uh, in his writings. Uh, that's my uh, that's my uh, idea. Yeah. Um, so. So basically, uh, these psychological okay. psychological shocks to Tesla causes him to become more like cryptic and withdrawn. Yeah. yeah. Which I can understand because after several bulldozings of my laboratories, I'm the same way. <laughs> I'm on disability because of it. Yeah. Yeah. So hey, you know, you mentioned what, um, Ernst. What is the title of the New, the New York? Um, Notes notebook from Tesla. It's kind of a recent Long, release. Long Island. Lo, the Long Island Long notes. Island, yeah. is, is that a book yeah. easy to get on Amazon or a little bit harder to find? It, could, would you be able to send me a link to that so I can try to get Eric a copy? Uh, yeah, you can order that from the Tesla Museum in Belgrade. Belgrade. That's where I got it from. But uh, <laughs> yeah, well. I'll send you a link. I'll send you the information to other one. Uh, okay. It's the quote from Colorado Springs to Long Island, and it's a, a edition put together by the Tesla Museum. I, I contacted the Tesla Museum because uh, the, the director of the Tesla Museum made an inventory of all the notes that Tesla uh, made and that they okay. have. And I saw many of those notes are included in the Colorado Springs notes. And I wanted the, the other ones as well. So then they pointed me to this book, which I bought, but it's still incomplete. There are, there are numerous notes that uh, were uh, inventoried, are uh, in the inventory, 
but not included in this book. So it, it's better. It's better than just the Colorado Springs notes, but it's it's still not complete. Okay, and also, um, you know, you had released some details, more of the technical details on your transformer inside of the building. You know, that's on the front of your book. I think in energetic forum a while back. Do you, if you're able to send me the exact link to those, to that discussion thread, um, I, yeah, I can post that as well. So Dan and whoever else wants more of the technical specs on, on your um, uh, your experiment there can uh, yeah, can have that. That'd be appreciated. Yes, I will. I, it's it's on the internet already. It's on my Google Drive. I can, uh, but I cannot see. Uh, I cannot verify if that's the latest version. So I will have to check on my computer. If that's the latest version, and then I'll send you. Uh, I'll update it and send you the link. Okay, sure, great. Eric's or uh, Ernst's book is Tesla's Magnifying Transmitter: Recreating Tesla's Dream. Um, I'll put a picture of the uh, the cover on it in this uh, on the video. Uh, when this call goes on YouTube, and I'll provide a link to Amazon. And also, again, anybody who came to the call or received the email or a Facebook post, there's a link to a uh, article that I put in uh, my website to tell everybody about this. Uh, there's a link that goes straight to the uh, the book on Amazon. Um, also, a final announcement. Um, you know, we only have about maybe 58 out of 150 something seats for the the ninth annual Energy Science Technology Conference that will be coming in July 11th through the 14th in Hayden, Idaho, which is about an hour from uh, Spokane, Washington. Uh, you can go to energysciencenconference.com. Um, you can go ahead and get registered and get your tickets there. Uh, those are usually sold out by um, late May, uh, sometime in the middle of June. Um, and so um, also if you want to check out some of Ernst's uh, posts, his username is uh, it's just Ernst, his uh, first name, on Energetic Forum. And you can do a search by uh, author of the posts or by the uh, discussion thread itself, and it'll, it'll pull up a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that he's posted. So um, any, any final words, Ernst, before we uh, hang up? Uh, no, I want to thank you, Aaron, for giving me this uh, opportunity to present my work. I hope that, uh, yeah that something could will come from it at the end. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thank you for your time, for taking time out of your schedule, getting up early <laughs> to make it on the call with us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, th thanks for sharing your work. And we'll, we'll look forward to more. And I'm sure we can do some more of these calls later on. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to do a call sometime where, um, you, you know, you and Eric just have an open discussion about Tesla, if you all are up to that sometime. Sounds yeah, good. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, hey, thanks, Eric, also. And um, uh, I'll be in touch with you soon. And for anybody else who got on the call, thank you. And uh, well, we'll see you all next time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye. you, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.